listening to the Dr. Claude Kirshner Show. My name is Dr. Claude Kirshner, and we are here to serve organizational leaders and agile teams who strive for excellence and differentiation. I hope you enjoy the content. If you have any questions or would like some additional resources, please visit our website at www.archconsults.com. Enjoy. So this episode is a little bit different today. I was interviewed by a friend named Danny from high school, and he's a successful entrepreneur. He's actually building and scaling an organization right now, an amazing, innovative idea and technology. And I think the theme of this conversation today is really about leadership and business, of course, but how do we leverage our experience as parents in some of the suffering and pain that we endure caring for others into how we become good leaders and being able to deal with some of the suffering that we have uh, as parents. Of course, there's a lot of joy there, but when your kid is going through something difficult, which we'll talk about today and my daughter's cancer diagnosis and how we can grow and change through some of those situations and still be there for our children and for the people that rely on us for our leadership. I hope you enjoy the episode. God bless. What is truth? What is good and evil? Am I good? Am I evil? Uh, why, why is there suffering and pain in this world? And what am I supposed to do about it? And what is my purpose here on earth? And, and these, are, these are questions that our children need to know. Welcome to episode three of the Founder Dad podcast. Today I'm joined by a friend of mine from high school, Claude Kirshner, whose family is dealing what probably most parents are most fearful of, and that is the sickness of a young child. Their daughter was diagnosed with leukemia at the beginning of this year, and they've been dealing with treatment during quarantine. And I've been following them on social media and been really inspired by the messages, the posts by Claude, his family, and most importantly, the images and videos of how his daughter has been with smiles and loves and positivity dealing with what is a very terrifying situation. So we're very grateful that he came on our show, that he shared his experience with us as a father, as a husband, as a businessman. And for me, what really stood out is the decision he made and how he made that decision on how to deal with the sickness, how to deal with the treatment, how to explain this to his daughter, and how he's keeping his family together. So we hope that you enjoy it. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, share with your friends, but most importantly, let us know what you think. All right, so you graduated from gunnery, and then um, remind me of like, what was next? Where'd you go to college? What'd you study? Yeah, what a journey since the gunnery. What did I study? After I graduated from the gunner, which was 2003, I went to Lehigh University, and that's a school in the Northeast, and it's in the Patriot League, and I was very blessed to get in there because it was probably a better school than what I was academically achieving, and I think that my sports helped, and also my father went there as well, so we did four years at Lehigh. It was a great four years. I played football for three out of the four, and then I quit my, my senior year because I had a concussion that it wasn't a career ending concussion, but it was one of those concussions that I just, I had no ambition to hit 300 pound offensive lineman anymore. So I stopped playing football, um, graduated with a decent GPA in um, business administration with a, a minor in commercial real estate and a minor in psychology. And I got a job working for CB Richard Ellis, which is a big commercial real estate company. Yep. And I worked there for three years and I was working as a researcher, which was an unbelievable platform for me to just learn from other people and just be sort of an introvert on a computer and figuring out, you know, what I was good at and what I wasn't good at. But I wanted to work in investment sales. So I wanted to sell um, big institutional assets. But at the time, the real estate market obviously was going down. My heart was always leading me into situations that were interesting, but um ended up going to Oklahoma State University. I got an MBA from Oklahoma State and I started working with my father 
in 2010. And at the time, I had two other companies, which I was just sort of messing around with. But the inundation of the tasks and the, the, the family necessity of the, the business just kind of became my focus. And I've been doing that ever since. And mm-hmm. it's been a glorious journey, of course. And you know, I was looking at your what you're doing and obviously just looking at LinkedIn and geez, the conversation today is just so interesting and, you know, talking about professional stuff, but mixing in the reality of being a parent and managing family life is a subject that is just so relevant. So tell me what, like what's going on with you? (laughs) Like Mm -hmm. what, what is this and and why are we talking and what project are you currently working on? Um, First, uh, after I became a dad, a lot of things changed, but, one thing that I definitely realized is like, I am responsible for this little human being. And I obviously love the kid more than anything in the world, um, which I'm damn sure that you can relate to. But then I started thinking like, yeah. I started thinking, I'm like, I have all this, all this life experience, like all these things that I've seen, all these things that I've learned that I want to share with my son, but I have no idea how to do it. Right. Because he's like, when he was born, he was small. You can't talk to him about the birds and the bees. Right. And I'm just thinking, you know, I did something as simple as making a video for him when he was born of me, like welcoming him to the world that I wanted him to be able to access when he gets older. I was literally in the hospital. I took the video and then I realized I'm like, all right, I have no idea what the hell to do with it because I didn't want to post it to social media. Right. It wasn't something that I wanted to share with my friends. I didn't want it to be honest. I didn't want it to send it to his mom for it to just get lost in like a, you know, like a messenger archive or something. And frankly, Again, it was for him. Like, it was something so personal that I didn't want to share it with anybody else. You know what I mean? It's like super emotional and everything. So, and then I started thinking, I'm like, I have this video. I have other things that I want to share with him. And like, how do you do it? Right. If back in the day, our parents or our grandparents used to write like journals or they used to make photo albums and give those down as like family heirlooms for a person to understand like where you came from in your family history. Now everything is in our phones. And I started looking around and seeing like, what, what, what is there any sort of solution or resource or platform um, that people are using? And I started talking to parents and I realized that, well, first of all, every parent at one time or another has like a desire to want to do it, right? It's like instinctual, right? Like you want to pass down your life experience, your family history, your life story to your kids, right? That's important. But there's no way to do it in an easy way. Like somebody creates an email, Right. And they just write emails to the kid and then they give the kid the, an email password. Right. When the kid turns whatever, 10 or 18, um, somebody creates an account on social mm-hmm. media for their kid on Facebook or on Instagram. Right. And just like uploads photos. But for me, I'm like, well, I don't want Facebook to have a monopoly on my life experience. Like Facebook is not a platform for the relationship between a parent and a kid. Neither is LinkedIn, neither is Twitter, neither is Instagram. So why would I be using no. something that, you know, when my kid gets older, I mean, I think people are like leaving Facebook now, like who knows if Facebook's even going to be, I mean, it's going to be around, but it's not going to be what it started as, right? It started as a place for friends, right? And I just like, you know, I was doing commercial real estate before that. I used to work for an investment bank before doing commercial real estate. So I was always, I always had a business background, but at the same time, like me and you, like we went to college and we started, you know, like we've seen the evolution of social media we've seen the evolution of mobile phones right and i saw an opportunity i was like listen i'm not the only person that's thinking about this i started doing some research i started talking to other parents and i basically said i'm like look if i make (laughs) if i create a platform or a way for you to kind of share everything that you want to share with your kid in due time like would you use it would you pay for it and when i got enough yeses and i heard enough like yeah that's a good idea i'm like all right i'll put in some money I had a couple friends, like literally like friends and family, and we just decided to like make an app and make a prototype and give it a shot. And that was a couple of years ago. And um, it's been an interesting road because I'm a first time tech founder. Right. So I had, you know, in the beginning, you know, you could read all the kind of books and you could read the articles and watch the YouTube videos. But when you start doing it, when you start running remote teams and you start releasing beta and A-B testing, I mean, there's a lot of things that you have to learn. So it's been it's been a hell of a ride. But at the same time. I'm having more fun and I find more meaning uh, value in what I'm doing now than any job that I had before. Because all the jobs that I had previously was just me working to like get a paycheck. I mean, I made good money, but I never asked myself, like, what is it that I actually want to do? And it's funny and corny or whatever you want to like, as funny as it sounds, it's like I feel like like this, this, this is what I was meant to do. 
like I didn't, you know, you don't know really the details of like the having the kid and everything, but you know, it was kind of like unexpected and it was random and just life throws these situations at you, which you either take. And I'm super lucky and I'm super happy that I became a dad and that my kid chose me to be his dad because it literally changed my entire life. And now like, this is all I'm doing. I literally dropped everything I was doing, put in all my money. Um, I'm away from my <laughs> kid right now. Yeah. And I mean, it's like, I'm living on, you know, I was up until a couple months ago when we raised our pre-seed, like, I was living on couches, renting cars, like, you know, and I used to, you know, I used to make like good money, you know, doing IV and doing real estate. And now it's like, you know, uh, I'm bootstrapping, renting studios um, in order to kind of like build this dream. But it's awesome because like we on, you know, we're, we're actually building something that's being used. Like we have a couple thousand people that are already like testing the app. Um, we're trying to figure out like the little bells and whistles to make it completely perfect because I don't want to go to market and start, you know, driving growth and putting in money into marketing. And before we know that the product is like completely perfect, long story short, we're creating a way for you to basically share, capture and share everything that you want to share ultimately with your kids and your grandkids, whether it's family history, whether it's your life story, whether it's your favorite books, whether it's your favorite movies, whether it's vacations, whether it's recipes, whether it's stories about your parents, about high school, like anything, anything that you think is important. It's incredible, Danny. And it, just mixing in your story and hearing your passion and starting off from when my child was born, my life changed forever. And I think every parent that actually really engages in being a parent has a very similar understanding of that. And the for whatever reason, whenever, whenever I think about my child, it is odd, but every other time I think about parenting Harper for the rest of her life for whatever reason I think about my own death my own demise and what if um, what if I died how would I what would my legacy look like what, what kind of parent would I be and what happens if that happens I won't be able to do certain things with my child and man I want to be able to impart as much as I possibly can on her about what boys to date what boys not to date I want to tell her about my own tragic experiences as a, as a not so smart teenager so that she can learn from it. And the fact that you're creating a platform to make that happen, Danny, it's amazing. I've always noticed that you have a big heart for people. And when I was looking through some of your social media and seeing what you were doing and why you were doing it, and I looked at the website and, and we're talking about generation transfer. That's, that's what you're talking about, right? Well, we rebranded it to um, Lena. Um, and we're probably going to rebrand it one more time and we're going to call it a life arc, you know, like life. Yeah. -E I love that. Arc, like ARK, right? Like, the yeah. Vessel. Like Noah's yeah. Ark, you know, putting everything on there that is, yep. is relevant to a, a new, a new transmission into a next generation. And it's, and it's yeah. It's special. It's so special. And and hearing you, I, I, wrote this, I read this book called The Blue Sweater, and it's what made me most interested in entrepreneurship. And it talked about uh, finance, microfinance. Mm -hmm. And it, it really, it took me into a different level of purpose and business. And I see too that you, your experience in corporate America or your experience in, in business acumen, whatever that meant, has allowed you to develop the gifts that is going to make this platform just explode. Oh, yeah. And especially with the with the passion that you have. So well, man, plus, it's, it's nice to talk to you. Plus, it's like, I mean, working kind of on Wall Street, also being a wrestler in high school and college, like you get it's yeah. in New York, like you get the hustle, like you're on the grind and you're OK with it. You know what I mean? And, yeah. um, you know, I'm glad that I have the background that I had because, like, I'm just used to getting shit done. Like, I don't care. You know what I mean? Like when you work <laughs> in an investment bank, nobody cares if you're like on the weekends. Like if you have a deadline Monday 9 a.m. and you don't do it, you're out of a job. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, it doesn't matter. But it's interesting that you mentioned um, kind of the realization of your own mortality. I never and like you got goose. I got goosebumps when you said it is because I never, you know, I was never honestly as crazy as it sounds like afraid of death until I had a kid. Yeah. You know? Because, you know, you realize like, all right, I'm responsible for this kid. First of all, I want to see him grow up. I want to be there with him, in your case, with your daughter as she grows up. And you also realize, all right, if I'm gone tomorrow, if you're gone tomorrow, like how is your daughter going to be able to grow up and really understand like who her father was, right? Who you really were. Is she going to check your Facebook? Is she going to check your LinkedIn? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. what are we leaving behind? And this is what this is what got me. I mean, once I realized this, this concern and the worry just took me over. I'm like, all right, what am I leaving behind in the case that I'm not around? And I also understand like 
the world, especially now, bro, like we're in the middle of COVID, there are riots, like the world is getting more complicated and there's going to be a lot of forces vying for our kids' attention. And they're not going to yeah. know, like they need like a North Star, they need a life arc, right? But they yeah. need a place where they could know that like this is like guiding principles or at least information, like what to believe because real news, fake news, social media, influencers, bloggers, they're, gonna, they're not going to know like who to trust. And I think as you know, like a parent is their child's first and most important teacher. And the question is, how are you teaching them? Like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, we're not always going to be around. Your kid's going to, your kid can go off to like boarding school or college, or, I mean, you're going to be going off to work. You know, we have plenty of parents that are like in the military. Um, I was talking to a buddy of mine from college. Like he literally did four tours. He was two times in Iraq, two times in Afghanistan. Like he barely sees his kids. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, but this idea that, we're not always going to be around, but we have to do something. That's like one of the main motivating factors. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want my kid to be raised on social media by like influencers. You know what I mean? No. Um, so tell me about your story. Um, when, when did you become a dad? How old were you? How did you, uh, like, how did that whole experience from start, like from day one, um, were there certain things that you kind of realized like, oh, my life changed the second I became a dad or was it more gradual? I can tell you in my case, like, you know, I remember holding my kid when he was born um, and I was more concerned of like not, you know, as crazy as it sounds like dropping him or anything bad happening. But I think this understanding and the kind of the attachment, the attachment bond grew with time when you actually realize like, you know, this is my flesh and blood and it is my kid. And then, you know, all these kind of things and emotions and realizations started, they, they came with time. I can't say it was like immediate, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm excited to tell you because, you know, my story is is an interesting one and I don't share it often, but recently because of my daughter's cancer diagnosis and the the life events that I've been kind of thrusted into, this topic is so meaningful to me. I, I want to be transparent and I want to be vulnerable. And and just what you're saying is there's too many things that need to be said, and especially nowadays in the culture that we live in that our kids need to rest upon in order for us to be able to lay a legacy. Becoming a father was a pivot in my story, that's for sure. But in preparation to become a father, let me tell you, I did not have the best of examples. Rewind back to the beginning, I grew up in a broken home. My parents were divorced and it was an interesting environment because both of my sisters were mentally disabled. My one sister's autistic and I think I actually talked about this in my senior speech. And it was, um, my mom is an alcoholic and my father was, he, he needed to leave the household. It was a, a righteous decision on his part when I was eight years old. So I was put in an environment where I had a mother who, it was unpredictable what would happen to me when I came home from school. Mm -hmm. I had a sister whose behavior as an autistic person was completely, you never knew what to expect. My other sister, she's amazing. Her name is Tammy. And uh, she just asked so many questions and she, I would have friends come over the house and she would just berate them with questions and she has severe ADHD and it's the cutest, most endearing thing you can be around when you're 30 years old. But when you're uh, an eight year old and you want to bring your friends over to play Nintendo games, it's, mm -hmm. it's embarrassing. You know, I never really had that solid rock of an example. And I grew up in a Catholic conservative family and I walked into the parenthood in a very non-traditional way. I was dating and, and living with a girlfriend. And at the time, I was not ready to be a father. Mm -hmm. And I was abusing alcohol. I was doing things that I shouldn't be doing. I wasn't married. I, I did not want to commit the rest of my life to this person. And from the day she found out she was pregnant, my internal complexities and some of my mental issues started just coming out in my life because this isn't the way I wanted this to work. And this isn't the, the, the classic approach to becoming a parent. And I got on the phone with my grandmother, God bless her soul. She passed away, but she said to me, and of course she said a lot of encouraging things to me, but when she found out that I was a father um, without getting married, she says, Claude, you are not a Kirshner. And she said, you, you're bringing a disgrace upon this family. And it was a one-on-one -on -one phone conversation that I, I, I seldom share with people because I don't want to, you know, take away from who she was as a grandma, but th mm. I heard that loud and clear. And it was, it was very difficult to deal with. And in that environment, and I feel like these subjects need to be spoken about because there are fathers and mothers out there right now. There are 
um, people who are preparing to become a father and they're not married and they need someone to listen to them and hear them out as to what are some of the dimensions of this relationship and how do your parents feel about that and let's talk about that and and how do you feel about this because my father was riddled with guilt he was not happy about the fact that I was going to become a father and I could see it all over his face when he was talking to his friends and it crushed me it crushed Mm -hmm. me was it just because you weren't married or because you didn't like what was his what was the like your grandma's kind of basis of and your father's kind of logic I think because I, they're a wealthy, established family and my, my grandma and her kids grew up in a Catholic church, I think it was just, it was a shame. Do you know what I mean? It was, uh, it was just not, it wasn't the way it was supposed to be. And I'm Claude the fourth, and I, so I represent a legacy and expectations placed upon my life to get things right and to be successful. And certainly you better get married before you have a child. And although those things were never actually spoken to me, it's clear that there was disappointment littered all over my family's, you know, connotation. So anyways, when I became a father, I was in a very harsh place. And, and like I said, I was, I was abusing alcohol and, you know, doing things I wasn't supposed to be doing, not being able to deal with my daily life, the stresses of work, the, stre- the expectations of becoming a good father. And that put me at probably the worst point in my life. Um, within the first three months of my my daughter Harper being born, and I was not a good boyfriend, I was not a good father, and I was not a good leader at work. All three of the things, hopefully, we'll talk about today. Mm-hmm. That it just it just brought me to a place. So I, I don't know if that kind of answers your question, but you can see the vulnerability that I'm willing to speak about because I guarantee you, I promise you. There are boys and men out there right now that are, are sharing in the same misunderstanding, confusion as, as to what am I supposed to do with this life now that I just impregnated my girlfriend that I don't know if I want to spend the rest of my life with her. There's so many questions and there's not a lot of other men to mm-hmm. listen and speak into that situation. Yeah, yeah. I, pre- I mean, I, I appreciate you going into especially the backstory with your family, which I didn't know about. Knowing what you like, so how did you deal with it? It's a, it's just such a solid question, and it's where hopefully a lot of the strength in this conversation will come from. Is I think the at any particular moment in a valley, a man really finds out really who he is, and he he looks for identity. And my identity in those times was was attached to my work. It was attached to my bank account. It was attached to my amount of friends. It was attached to my image. It was attached attached to my athleticism and it was all of these what i call them as resume virtues that really were good it helped me develop my gifts but when it came down to the the true life things like you know hey am i gonna be a good father i didn't have any answers to those questions in my Mm -hmm. resume where i still had to be a leader at work i still had to be a father i still had to deal with the complexities of life and the Mm -hmm. challenges that it presents I was leading myself spiritually into the church. And, and that was really the only place I knew where to go. When I came to faith and I started surrendering some of these things that I really have no idea how to handle and started looking to you know the Bible or starting looking to other men that mm-hmm. I knew had a, a place of um, influence in this world and asking those challenging questions, I started d- discovering my identity. You know, identity, wow, what a... What a concept. And, and I still see men these days at work, a lot of times at work that are just their identity is caught up in their ability to to build or to create or, yep. you know what, Danny, I, I, I'm, I question your ability to even spend time with me because of um, whether or not you're, you're successful in business. Like, do you have something to offer me? What are we talking mm-hmm. about today? And there are grown men that act that way. And, and I, I've made it my mission in life to set my core values and identity. So I'm a man of faith. I'm a, a man about family and I'm a man about leadership and I'm a man of strength. And when I say strength, it's not, you know, here, look at me, how strong I am. It's the internal strength, which my internal strength, I was as weak as a skinny boy. The first time you ever went into the gym as a 14 year old, Danny, I was weaker than that. When it came to dealing with those real issues in my life. And over time, I've been able to get a life coach, um, get some mentors into my life, go to church, dive into the scripture and figure out who I really was. 
And that's, that's what created my ability to be a good father more than anything. And nobody ever taught me those lessons. Nobody, no school, no college. Yeah. Life experience taught me that lesson. And having a child was, I remember standing up in front of the group of people and I remember bringing a picture of my daughter with me. And I, I was in tears in front of 200 people. And I said, this is why I want to get better. This is, I want to be a father to my daughter. I don't want to be somebody who is, is absenteeism. I don't want to be somebody who isn't there when, when she's in need because I'm, I'm caught up in some stupid endeavor. And that's really been part of my strength to kind of seek and find my identity in, in something other than work and money and relationships. How old was she? How old was she when you were going through the, this process? You said three months or six months or? She was six months old. I remember her mother left me when she was three months. And that was kind of a, a big thing. And, and it was needed that my her mother uh, leave me because I was not being a good father. And then mm -hmm. three months after she left me and my daughter left the house, and obviously I'm now in this situation where I have a child out of wedlock and I have a daughter that I was hoping to kiss goodnight every night, and now she's not there anymore. So you said an interesting thing. You said that like I was physically strong, but I wasn't strong. So what's your definition do you have a definition of strength now? Like what is strength to you? Like for a real, like for a real man, woman? If you ask me that question and obviously being a man of faith, strength is love. It is a persevering, mm -hmm. enduring characteristic of not only embodying love for myself, but being able to exude love in all circumstances. One of the most powerful things I've learned is that I'm called to not only just love my friends and family, but I'm called to love my enemies and, and pray for them and to, and if I'm capable of loving in all of those circumstances, then I, I'm strong. The, the, the person who is riddled with bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness, th those are the people that end up not being able to persevere through challenging times because it's, it's everybody around them and not themselves. So yeah, man. My, yeah. my definition of strength would be to be a, be a man that is able to display love and create joy in all circumstances even though it's difficult, we have to forgive and we have to love the people who've hurt us. That's true strength. I mean, you're talking about, you know, what's happening in the world nowadays and, and being able to forgive. Oh my gosh, what, what, a, what a concept, right? Yeah. And, and is, are people capable of doing that? And who's teaching them how to do that? And do they love? Is that... So anyways, that's kind of your answer to the question of, of true strength. No, I'm, listen, I agree with you 100% fully. And then how has, all right, how has that helped you because of the situation that you've been dealing with, with your daughter's diagnosis? I bet for damn sure that if you hadn't gotten that realization, you hadn't gotten help and you hadn't like started actually, you know, changing your mindset and the way that you look at the world and the way that you approach the world, it would have been a lot. I'm sure it's still difficult. And I know that it is. Um, I can only imagine. But without that mindset, I'm sure dealing with the situation that you've been dealing with for the last couple of years would have been nearly impossible, right? Nearly impossible. So, all right. So then tell me about how you, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know how like personal and detailed you want to go, but like, when did you guys find out about the Sith situation? How was your relationship at that point already with your wife, right? Because you guys did get married, right? No, I, I actually married a different woman, but um, I can touch a little bit on that as well. Yeah, yeah. So what, so kind of what, what happened next and how did that whole <laughs> thing come about? Well, getting, getting right with yourself and learning how to love yourself is, is one thing. And, and dating myself and, and pretty much being single for three years uh, was huge because I got one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus, one-on-one -on -one time with mentors, one-on-one -on -one time with myself, ability to, to lean into these challenging circumstances. And life did not get any easier. It, it got just as challenging. So the, the complexities at work just got more complex and um, but a lot of the, the factors before that were, were creeping in on my ability to be effective as a leader, as a father, were no longer there. And my relationship with my daughter's mom got progressively better. And we're still talking about forgiveness to this day. And it, it, it's hard. But the reality is I was capable of setting aside my selfishness and setting aside my my ambitions as a as a man and saying what comes first and what comes first to me is is my faith and if i'm if i'm really wanting to be the man that i've never really had many examples to be 
I have to build a relationship with my daughter's mom. And that is so important to me. And I've laid myself down. I've died to self so many times in conversations with her and I cried, literally cried and said, I, I just can't, I don't know what to do. I'm afraid. And, and with some of that vulnerability, and that was one of the things I want to talk about today. And, and everyone mm. says, you know, vulnerability, it's, it's, it's so, you know, I'm almost passive because I don't know about you, Danny. I, I hang out with guys nowadays that aren't afraid to cry. And I, that's, just, that's, that's just who I am. But I know some people may be listening or some people may not feel that way. And um, whatever, to each their own. But when it becomes a time where it's, I need to cry, that demonstrates oh, yeah. and builds a relationship more than anything. So getting right with my, my daughter's mom was important. My ducks will never get in a row. Let me be clear with that. I'm completely lost <laughs> and I will never be perfect. But the reality is uh, my ducks started getting into a, a row a little bit better. And, I, don't, um, I don't think the goal is perfect. I think the goal is to always be improving and just be the best yeah. version of yourself. And if you're a better version of yourself today than you were yesterday and you're always progressing and, you know, you know that you have a goal and a name and that your goal is to kind of just be the best you are. I mean, nope, like define perfect. Perfect is just a word. You know what I mean? Exactly. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I, I may strive to get there, but I'm, I'm never going to get there. And I don't think there's there's any achievement of that. But anyways, leaning towards the the pursuit of what would be hopefully a more peaceful life and i think peace is the real value money is is not i was able to find my wife and and finding my wife came only because of the years of preparation i put myself in do you think i would have been able to find a, a strong good looking successful woman that was willing to spend the rest of the, her life with me if i was riddled with resentment towards the the mother of my child or if i wasn't a good dad or if i was going out and and getting drunk on the weekends no yeah so to to in any way if i can say you know it is so important for a man prior to being a good husband or being a good father to be right in his own accord and and not doing some of the things of the past the childish behaviors have to be gone I, I was able to meet my wife and, and talking about my daughter's cancer diagnosis. Wow. Yeah. Meet, meeting my wife and, and courting my wife through the, the dating process um, was an interesting journey. And she, she and I, we, 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 we talked, we hung out, we did things we weren't supposed to do. And we, we always talked and we were always staying in touch an hour and hour long, hour long conversations led to eventually we started dating one another. And mm -hmm. we knew that when we started dating one another, that that was going to be, you know, we, we already had synergy and chemistry together. When we started dating, it was, we did it right. We, we kept pure with one another. And um, that courting process, and then which led to me asking her to marry me and spend the rest of my life with me, which is one of the most amazing days of my life. And then leading up to the wedding, we, we came, two became one, and we became a, a beautiful um, example of what, I believe of a godly relationship should look like. And, and then all of a sudden that God said to us, you know, you think you life is good. I'm going to throw in two miscarriages that happened in the relationship because we wanted to get pregnant mm -hmm. and she ended up having two miscarriages. And then right after the second miscarriage, my daughter, her stepdaughter got diagnosed with cancer. And so when we're talking about some of the things, these life events that you have and you've talked about, Man, you know, I, but the point of that, I was ready for that diagnosis. I was prepared for it. It was the hardest day of my life to date was that day. I'll never, ever forget it. And mm -hmm. I was crushed. I was absolutely crushed. Um, but how old but, was Harper when that diagnosis came about? So Harper was diagnosed on January 8th, 2020. And at that time, we didn't know what to do. We didn't know who, you know, what, what was going to happen to our baby girl. And it was every day we had information from the doctors about whether it was ALL or AML. ALL is a, is a more preferred diagnosis. You know, what the treatment plan would look like, how long we needed to stay in the hospital. Is the treatment working? How, what are her blood levels at? All of these questions were slowly but surely provided to us. And, and mm -hmm. praise God, she, she went into remission um, after her initial consolidation, which for 30 days, they just hit you with drugs and they hit you with steroids. She got super, she got super um, um, 
afraid to say it because she might be listening to this one day, but she got a little tubby <laughs> and she, she was requesting meatballs on, on the regular and um, she was taking steroids and it was, it was so hard to witness this cute four-year-old going through that process. But the day that we heard that she was in remission was, it's so funny, you know, when you become a dad, you think, I thought that I had issues prior to becoming a father. I thought that the fact that I couldn't go to the gym on a Tuesday night was the oh, world yeah. is going to end. <laughs> yeah. But then your daughter gets diagnosed with cancer. And then you, you go into this new journey of when she got into remission, it was the most glorious day of my life. It went from the worst to the most glorious. And, you know, ever since, it's just been an interesting uh, co-parenting relationship with her mom, an interesting dynamic with my wife being a stepmom mm-hmm. and um, stepping into this new future with a, a stepdaughter who has cancer and a dad who shaved his head because, um, you know, I just love my daughter. And, and what's yeah. her role in this? And, and where does she play? And then you can go into discipline and you discipline a four-year-old who has cancer. And what does that look like? And mm. All of these questions, man, it's, it's wild. I'm curious about the relationship that your wife, like how you guys kind of, how you introduced her to your daughter, but um, how did you explain to Harper the diagnosis? Like, what was that conversation like? And what was her, what's her personality like? Because, I mean, when, when I see pictures, when you post stuff, I mean, she always looks super happy, super yeah. positive. And that's probably because I'm assuming that you did something in terms of the way that you communicate and the way that you approach the situation, it doesn't seem like she's scared. You know, mm-hmm. it doesn't, I mean, she probably is concerned, but um, how did you make that? Dis- because it obviously was a conscious decision of how are we going to communicate this to our daughter and what's the kind of environment that we're going to set around or create in order for her to kind of go through this. Right. So tell me about that. Well, in our household, we do not believe in the spirit of fear. We believe in power, love, and sound mind. So we acknowledge that it exists, but we, we always believe in the spirit of joy. And when we can create joy in any environment, and that goes with our stay in the hospital, we were filled with joy. And, and when Harper was down, it didn't get all of us down because we had a joy that was enduring. And we were loving on the nurses. We were loving on the doctors. We were dancing around the hospital. Anytime we had a chance to, to get out and play, we got out and played and, and we had fun together. And at times where we were, you know, and, and we were in the hospital for a long time, we would watch fun movies and it, mm-hmm. we, would, we would talk about things that are serious. But I appreciate you saying that, Danny, because it, it means a lot to me that you see a spirit of joy in my daughter because of course. Um, yeah. it, it, The social worker told me, and obviously with COVID and everything going on, the decisions that we need to make in a time like this when we have your cancer patient and who should I be exposed to and who should mom be exposed to are just, they're they're daunting. They're overwhelming. And the the social worker said to us, she said, Claude, you and Brianna are great parents. And you know how I can tell you're great parents? Because your daughter is is a beautiful, joy-filled daughter. You're doing a good job. So be easy on yourself. And that, it really meant a lot. You know, to answer your question, she is spirit-filled, the, the innocence of a child. I want to study it because yeah, she doesn't know really what the, the caliber of her diagnosis is. She doesn't understand. When she says leukemia, it's the cutest thing in the world. Daddy, I can't do that because I have leukemia. And I'm just like, she doesn't <laughs> say it as, as well as that, but it's so cute. And the time where I had to tell her, we brought her to Miami Cancer Institute where she... I was, in, um, I was in a group study down here in Ocean Reef Club in the Keys with a bunch of grown men. I had my cell phone off. And the moment I, I got out, I called my dad back. And my dad had called me two or three times. And the, the mother of my child had called me two or three times. And I decided that I was going to call my dad back first. So I called him and he said, Claude, I, I, I went into this story about what was relevant in my world. My dad listened to the story and he said, Claude, I have to tell you something. And I said, what? He says, Brianna's calling me and, and she thinks that, that Harper has leukemia. And I was thinking, leukemia, okay, um, isn't that like Lyme disease? You know, isn't that mm-hmm. something that's no big deal? And no, he said, Claude, that, that's cancer. And, and you're going to have to go pick her up right away. And you got to call the doctor and you got to call Brianna. So I got off the phone and that's when the journey began. I went to her school and I picked her up at school and she said, Daddy, why are you here? She looks perfectly healthy. Mm-hmm. And I, I was just crushed. And her mom and I and my daughter 
my daughter and her mom, we drove up to Miami Cancer Institute and we got right in because my wife works for Baptist Health, got mm-hmm. an appointment with one of the best oncology um, doctors in, in all, all the whole world, a brand new facility. And I walked into that and I knew that we were in the right place because I have, I'm doing a DBA, a doctor in business administration. And in my cohort, the guy who runs, who's the associate vice president of the MCI, the Miami Cancer Institute, he was one of the first people that greeted me. He gave me a big hug and he said, Claude, I have a three-year-old son. If this was to happen to him, I would bring him here. You're in the right hands. You're in the right place. So we walked in, did the blood test. We were all praying and holding hands. It was me, my, my, um, the mother of my child, and my wife together, crying. Wow. Holding hands so you all went, the three of you. We went, the three of us. Wow. And a lot of this is this, we call it blended and blessed. We're walking in this together. And it's another testament to our ability to be strong in co-parenting. Um, so I went, once we found out that Harper, it was clear, she, the blood test ran again, she has leukemia. We cried a little bit. And then I, I walked Harper, she had to go to the bathroom. I walked in the bathroom with her and I had the first one-on-one time with her I've had since the diagnosis. And in the bathroom, I started crying and I said, Harper, you know, things are going to change. And she said, I don't understand, daddy, what do you mean? And I said, we're, we're going to be coming to the doctors a lot now and, and life is just going to be different. And she said, okay, daddy. And I said, Harper, I need you to promise me something that you're going to be strong and that you're going to be okay with this. And she said, daddy, I'm going to be okay with it. And it was so cute. And really she has been okay with it ever since. And she has showed fortitude, perseverance, innocence, love, kindness to strangers on the street. She's on my shoulders with a shaved Mm -hmm. head dancing and singing. And people look at us and they're probably like, wow, you know, she's skinny and she's got black around her eyes and she's clearly going through an intense phase of chemotherapy, but Mm -hmm. she's still smiling and she's still singing. And what else can you do? What can you control? So that's sort of the the gist of it. And that's pretty raw as far as what I'm, you know, sharing with you. I think that's the one thing that every parent is afraid of and terrified of, obviously. Um, Yeah. And then, then let me ask you a question. What do you do then when it, when it comes into your life? Bro, I think I think you do exactly what you did. You fill them with love. You get rid of fear. Um, kids, like you said, it's such. It's. I mean, I see it with my own kid. Like they're pure, unless they see negativity. Like there's no reason for it. Like they don't know that yeah. it exists, right? Like they're only a product of what they see around the world and the relationship that they see with you and her mom and you and your wife. And they are pure love. Like they're pure. They're they're curious. They're positive. And they're much stronger than we think. And they're much smarter than we think. What does one do? I mean, I think you did the right thing. You fill it with love and you, you know, you be honest about things. And I mean, you know, I, I got teary eyed when you were telling me the story because she's just positive. And she said, yeah, I'll be fine. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, you know, I'm sure, I'm, I'm, I'm sure if she saw on your faces that you were like dreary and that you were concerned and that you and your wife started, you and the mother of your kids started fighting, then, you know, kids feel that stuff. You know what I mean? But if you're yeah. strong, if you're strong, if you're an example, if your wife is, if Brianna is, then, you know, she feels that and she's like, all right, well, this is my kind of, you know, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep the, the, the same level. So. I learned that the battles that we fight start in my mind. You know, if I can't control what's in my mind, I'm not going to be able to fight many battles. And then the second battle that I fight is in my home. And being a good husband, being a good father, is that that comes with a whole set of battles. Mm-hmm. And then the, the third battle is at my work. And who who am I as a as a leader at work? Who am I as either an employee or an employer? And then the the fourth battle is the battle of my church. And some people can say their community, their neighbors, their um, their gyms, their country clubs, whatever you you say. And to me, those are the four major grounds for fighting. And I had to, before I could be a good father, I had to figure out what, how I was going to deal with this. Mm-hmm. And then I had to figure out how I was going to lead a household through this. And then I had to figure out how I was going to deal with it, how I was going to lead a household through it. And then how, how was I still going to be able to be a servant leader and a steward of a business in addition to that? And then how can I still serve my community and show my community that I care about them in a time of need, in a time of COVID, you know, and what, what would, how could I possibly muster up the strength to do that alone? 
<laughs> it was crazy. So, so was it a conscious, like, what clicked? Like, at, at what point? Like, when did you basically have to sit down with yourself? Because you probably did have time alone when you're in your own head. And you're like, all right, I'm like, this is the way that I'm going to be. Like, so how was, did you have a conversation with yourself? Did you talk to somebody from the church? Was it something you read in the Bible? Like, what, was there an aha moment when just, like, things clicked in your mind? And you're like, all right, this is the mindset and the approach that I'm taking in every single aspect. At home, with Harper, at work, at the church. I, the the scripture that I think of more than anything is how Jesus is speaking to the, the Christians of the world and saying, you are a, a city on a hill and you are the light and the darkness. And that with me, you don't need anything else. And what, what I've been leaning into and in listening to some of my pastors speak, the thing that speaks most clearly to me is, is when I have no guilt in life, no fear of death, that's the power of Christ in me. And when I can really embody a spirit of, um, like we talked about joy, and I can still be a light to others, regardless of my circumstance, I can sense a strong power in that. And there are people around me that are, are crumbling. And, and I'm not saying that I'm strong enough, but, but with him, I'm strong enough. And being a light. Regardless, if I, if I thought that becoming a parent and becoming a business owner and becoming a leader, I was, I was signing up for a life of still waters and a life of just, oh, utopia, ah, I'm wrong. The greater influence I want to have, I have to have a bigger threshold for pain. So oh, yeah. when, I, when I started rethinking this concept of pain, I started literally, and this might sound crazy, but being grateful for this cancer journey, being being honored by this, by being, being a servant of the Lord during a time like this and COVID and a cancer journey, and I could still speak hope and faith into other people, that, that's what's given me the ability to, to endure this, is, is to still be able to help others. And, you know, I, again, I thank you for the interview because hopefully some stuff that I say, if there's just one person out there that could get strength, that may be going through a similar story or, or maybe has a, a difficult home situation, that they can look at that sacrificial love as as powerful as powerful people people see you danny they know what you're doing they know that you, you're a good father they see what you're doing in your company and it provides them with hope and and if you can be a source of hope what other legacy is more important nothing <laughs> i don't you couldn't give me 10 million dollars to, to trade in for my ability to be uh, give hope to other people who are heavy laden or downtrodden or hopeless because with hope, you, they, they can do anything. They can turn their situation around. I agree. They can turn their situation around or they can actually, you know, make sure that a bad situation, a tragic situation stays a tragedy, but doesn't become hell and does, that doesn't take over yeah. your life. And that's the unfortunate, you know, that's the unfortunate reality about life. And that's exactly what, you know, the story of Christ and a lot of stories in the Bible, which are super interesting. I don't know if you know this, but I was a religion major in college. Wow. But, yeah, yeah I, I studied religion, political science. Um, I studied all religions, but I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, very, you know, the stories in the Bible are not there by accident, you know what I mean? And you could look at them as stories or you could look at them as the culmination of the people that were living during that time, taking kind of like life lessons from real situations and basically saying like, you know, these are the things that happen to you in life. And this is the way that you should be existing in the world. And the things that they talk about, whether it was like thousands of years ago, where those stories go back even further you know, they're, you know, they apply the human Today. experience. The human experience is still the human experience, whether it was 30,000, well, not 30,000 years ago is a little bit different, but, you know, whether it was 1,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, or now when we have iPhones, like, it's still the same thing. Like, life is yeah. suffering, you know, suffering is part of life. The question is, like, do you bear it? Do you do it with love? Do you do it with anger? How do you deal with those things? And, I mean, you're right to say that, like, Christ is the perfect example of a person literally, like, bearing the cross, you know, no matter what, like not being phased by whatever life or God or his father or the world is throwing at him and just like staying the path, love, truth, right? Truth. Yeah. Responsibility. Yeah, man, you're living it, dude. Thanks for telling me that because it, it's nice to know that you can relate to some of those, those of things that I'm throwing out there. And, and when I, prior to being saved and, and stepping into faith, I would see men that were Christian men that were leading as Christian men. And I saw that and I was, I was envious of that. I thought, wow, that, 
that's powerful. And, and you, you can be a good husband and a good father and a good business owner at the same time. And, and you can talk about your struggles at home and, and this kind of stuff. And, and I didn't know what I was signing up for when I decided that, hey, um, I'm going to try this, this faith thing out and, and see how it works. And in reality, the, the biggest lesson that I've learned is, is man, it's, it's a life of sacrifice. And it's not about the, you know, being attracted to that power of the transparent leader who's capable of leading with core values, virtues, godliness. These things are easily, people say, wow, what's that? I want that. But in order to get there, the scripture says you have to lay your life down and you have to pick up your cross daily and follow me. It is one of the hardest things anyone could ever do. And I, I love this. I think this would be a good segue into that pain of Danny's passion and love for his children. Obviously, I'm sure there's pain through your story too. And my pain of the cancer diagnosis, how then do I parlay that into becoming a business leader? And how can I take that pain and how can I be of righteous influence to the people around me? And how can I, how can I leave a legacy in business and use some of that pain in my leadership in a good way, a constructive way for other people? So I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and throw that question at you first to see what you think. How does it fit um, into being a father and a husband and, and, a, and a, a family member? How does that fit into business leadership? Well, I mean, I'm only now learning how to be like a CEO and actually build a team. Um, all my jobs previously, I've been kind of, you know, whether I was doing um, fixed income sales, or whether I was doing real estate brokerage, I was kind of like a lone wolf. You know what I mean? I was very reliant on myself um, and I wasn't used to working in like a huge team environment. And even when I started creating this app, and this was a realization that I had with time is I was too focused on myself. I was too focused on making a product that just solves my problem. And when I switched the focus yeah. The focus not on me, but like, who are the people that I'm actually serving? Who yeah. am I making this for? You know, because I can make an app for myself and give it to my kid and that's it. But it's not a business. That's not something that I'm going to be known or remembered for. And it's not what I want to do. Um, although knowing that I'm making a gift for my son and knowing that like he's the driving force, like he's he's driving me more than like any money that I could make. You know what I mean? Obviously, yeah. I want, you know, we're going to make money and I want to be successful um, and I want to be able to like, you know, have a life that I want to have with my, you know, with my son and my family. Um, but, you know, the driving force wasn't money. The driving force was, you know, this is something I want to do for my kid. And in terms of how to get through like tough times, you know, Nietzsche wrote, he who has a why can bear almost anyhow, right? So That's when you good. have that, yeah, so when you have that kind of meaning in your life and you have that aim, then you could deal with all the crap because you know, like, I know why I'm doing this. I know it needs to exist. Um, and I believe in it, obviously, full, you know, with my entire being. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it. Um, but now, yeah, now it's building a team. Now it's, you know, finding the people that also have the same values that are parents, that want to be good parents, that realize the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and it's interesting just surrounding yourself, surrounding myself with like like minded um, people that believe yeah. in the same mission, you know. Um, How many people do you have in your team? Including five some of your subcontractors and vendors. Yeah, so so we have five engineers. We have um, a designer. We have a person helping us do PR and social media. We have a marketing director. Um, and then we have a marketing advisor. I have like 12 investors, 14 investors that have invested in the company so far over the last couple of years. Um, so it's around like 12 people. It's 12 people. Um, and it's you all have an ambassador in me, for sure, and my wife. <laughs> Yeah, man, we're going to we're going to be we're kind of doing a lot of R&D and we're doing customer development now, but we're going to be launching soon. And once we launch, I mean, we'll definitely talk about how to get this in front of other people. Um, and I'd be curious how you kind of, you know, I mean, you'll see the app. But um, what's interesting is we help you basically uh, compartmentalize and categorize all these different aspects of your life experience. Because, for example, if you have like take Facebook, for an example, it's just one timeline. Right. There's no yeah. structure to it. Right. In our universe, right, in this life arc, we have like different categories of life experience. So you'll have one kind of timeline where it's just Harper. You'll have another timeline that it's like your family. And then when you go in that, you have your father, your mother, your grandparent, right? So you can just start populating with, with information about every single different person. And within that person, you know, their interests, their birthday, where they grew up, what they studied. Then you have yeah. a part for your early life, right? Like your high school, your college. Who were the people that influenced you? What were the books that you liked? What was the music that you listened to? And then we keep going and we keep going in terms of like, 
you know, the things that you love, the things that you're interested in, your books, your music. So it's a way to basically centralize everything that makes you who you are all in one place. Because now you have an account on social media, you have an email, you have an iTunes account, you have YouTube, you have all these different like separate things. But if you were going to give something to Harper to say, hey, this is who your dad is. These are the things that I want to share with you. And these are the things that I, are important for you to know. Yeah. It's all in one place. Plus, what's super interesting is I've always, you know, I studied religion. I've always been interested in self-development. I've also worked with psychologists and business coaches. I've worked with psychologists when it comes to dealing with my ex-wife. I've worked with psychologists and business coaches when it comes to dealing with business. So I've always been like super self-reflected and introspective. And I love that sort of stuff. And I've realized that, you know, answering questions like what's your definition of success? What's your definition of love? What's your definition of good and evil? Um, what are your thoughts on death, loss, sacrifice? So yeah, th these are all things that you have to, not have to, but it's useful to like get on paper and ask yourself those questions. And then yeah. your answers to those questions are things that you could be sharing with your kid, right? <laughs> A lot of times in our culture, we're so busy being busy. We're so busy teaching kids how to make paper airplanes and taking them to the mall to buy stuff and getting them play dates and just constantly in this, uh, from, from what I see, in this culture of activity. And these heavy questions that you just answered, to have those moments and reflect with your child about what does it mean to die? What, is it, what, what, what does it mean to, I love what you said, um, success. success. What, what yeah. a great, what is, what is the definition of success? And, and what does that mean to you? And let me tell you what it means to me. Mm. And let me tell you what success is. And, and to be able to tell a child that, you know, I've had these conversations of meaning of life with my father, but they've been few and far between. And we're having more of those conversations now than I've ever had in my entire life. Now that, you know, we both have faith in our life. Now that we're, we're walking through this journey together with my daughter and my dad is being the dad I've always wanted him to be. And I think in to parlay the whole being a father, being a husband, being a leader and business owner, you know, being a father, what, is that, what does it mean to be a father? And in my opinion, being a father is the most precious gift we can ever have. But then it's also the biggest sacrifice. And then you think about being a husband. Okay. Also, one of the most precious gifts a man can have and one of the biggest sacrifices. And then you think about being a business leader. Also, one of the most precious gifts a man can have and one of the biggest sacrifices. It's all the same. Yep. I, I love what Craig Groeschel says at the end of his podcast. He says, people always want to follow a leader. They want to follow leaders who are always real and not a leader who's always right. If I'm who I am at home, who I am as a father and who I am as a business leader, not only does that take a level of guilt and, and you know, am I chasing after the right things? I genuinely care about my staff. I genuinely care about the success of serving customers. And I'm, I can get hurt too. It's okay. But at the end of the day, we're going to get through this because we're a family, we're a team, and we're going to mm -hmm. make this work. And we're here on a mission and we have a vision. And if I'm leading a household, what's the same thing? What's the mission of our household? What's the vision we have as a family? Do we have goals as a family? Do you talk we, about those things? Do you outline them? Like, do you have those conversations with your team at work, with your family? At work, we, we run on an EOS system called Traction. And it's... Um, it's an amazing book by a guy named Gino Wickman, and it really helps us set those core values, pick your team, um, have your, they call them rocks, their quarterly goals, and then it allows you to have the blueprint to run a leadership team. And my goal here at work is to grow and develop a leadership team. And then our mission is to serve our customers. Our vision is to, is to develop people who have a heart to serve. And what does that mean? Do, do we serve our customers just uh, because we have to serve our customers? No, we serve our customers because we care about our team. And we know that mm -hmm. if we endure the, the hardness of serving our customers, um, then we can grow some of the people that work here and we can bring in new staff members or we can develop existing staff members. And that's not always easy to serve our customers. But if we do it well, we're going to be profitable. We're a service company. And I talk to people all the time. If, they don't, if you don't like people, don't work in the service industry. It's just a matter of fact. And not only that, if you're not the right person, you working in the service industry with a team of service-minded leaders, you're going to be toxic in that environment. So the best yep. thing for you is to either not be on this team or to change your virtues and core values to fit in with the team so that we can continue serving together. And man, it, there's nothing easy about that. And, and being a father, being a husband, being a leader at work, the priorities, maybe you can relate, which one is most important? <laughs> That's a good question. I think if you have a foundation of like 
values, principles, and an, and, and an approach to life, then that works everywhere. It applies yeah. everywhere. You know what I mean? You can't be one person at work, a different person at home, and then a third person in the church. You have to Can be you imagine? No. You know, yeah. Do you know how much, how hard it would be to put on and, and all three of those different environments if you weren't the same person stepping into all, all three? Well, listen, not, not a lot of people know who they are. Not a lot of people, listen, I mean, like you mentioned, like you're happy and you're grateful for the struggles that you had because those struggles, it's only through struggle that you change. Like most people don't want to change and most people are happy to be in their comfort zone are most likely going to stay in their comfort zone if life doesn't throw them some things, right? Yeah. Um, and it's only, I mean, I'm, I've changed over the last couple of years, like going through this kind of journey as a founder and also being divorced, being away from my kid. Like those things have shaped me into who I am. And I want to hear your definition of success. I'm curious, but you did touch upon one thing, like, you know, being a dad and on a very elemental, simple level, the point of life is to continue life, right? That's what's been going on in the universe since the beginning of time or the beginning of the universe or whatever you want to call this thing that we're living in. We're living in a society where less and less, I mean, I know the statistics because I'm dealing with this stuff, but like less and less, you know, I don't want to say millennials, not our generation, but people younger than us, they want to have less kids. They don't want to have kids. They think that it's a burden. They think that it's difficult. They think that the, the world is more dangerous. We are living right now at the most like safe, developed, like best time in the world. We're not yeah. in the time of Cold War where our parents were like threatened by the, you know, threat of nuclear war. We're not living during World War II. We're not living in the Great Depression. Like our parents, our grandparents, our great parents, great grandparents live through much more difficult times but we think that like oh my god like the world is more dangerous and people are getting more selfish and they want to you know they want to be on instagram and they want to be i mean i'm instagram i'm just saying like symbolically right like people are more focused on themselves and for some reason you know they have less and less desire to want to have kids and like have a family where the people that do have kids most of them that i've spoken to find that that's given them more fulfillment and joy even though it's hard than any other part of your life you know what i mean because like what are you doing all this for what are you what are you making the money for what are you trying to have a job for for what you know you know the feeling of having your daughter hug you and just like look at her and i mean this <laughs> that's that, the best feeling yeah, in the you world can't, you can't trade that for anything you know yeah next um, to my wife hugging me and telling me those things too yeah i put her first by the way i have to put my wife first or i don't know how my my standard of living would would be able to exist yeah, I haven't I haven't gotten there yet. I was married. I got divorced. Um, you know, I don't I don't know what it's like to have um, like a real partner by my side that, you know, where we have an ideal relationship. Unfortunately, that that hasn't been my forte. I've been good at dating, but to really find somebody, you know, it's also not easy, like having a kid, being a founder, traveling around and me yeah. like I've been, you know, I've been independent and kind of away from my parents since I was 15 years old. So I don't I technically don't need anyone, you know what I mean? Like I'm fine solo, you know, and like I've always thought like, all right, if somebody's gonna come into my life, like who's really gonna be helping who? And like, what's the point? You know what I mean? Like, is is this person gonna slow me down, make my life better or not? Maybe that's yeah. the wrong approach. Maybe I do, you know, I'm not saying that I have the right attitude about it and I probably don't, but I hope that one day I do find a person that I wanna, you know, that I fall madly in love with. And But just, I'm also the type of person where it's the definition of love, which is also an interesting thing, but like, I can't imagine saying, oh, I can't imagine living without you or like living without because I'm living without the person now. And like, yeah. I'm also not doing too bad. You know what I mean? So it's interesting. I used to have a very similar context about my need to have another person in my life. And I think that once I started understanding that another person, I, I learned so much about myself through other people. And I knew I wasn't ready for a wife. And when I when I started learning about what a wife is and what it means to have a wife, I cannot be filled up by another person. I have to have a different source to be filled from. And when I'm filled up and I'm bringing myself into a relationship, then I, I'm much better. And, and hopefully they have a very similar philosophy with that as well. My entire life, I've struggled with intimacy and relationships. And I never knew how to do it or what to do until I decided to just surrender it to, to God and, and and really kind of look at what does it look like to have a relationship with another woman? How do I go about this? What, what are, if there's, if this is what it says, let me try to apply it and see what happens. And it wasn't until I started doing that, you know, and, and I find that the biggest, most honorable thing I see in men is their ability to love and respect their wife. And if they don't have a wife, then it's their ability to love and respect their mom or their ability to love and respect their sister or their ability to love and respect their daughter. Just, how do they treat women and, and what does that look like? 
you know, laying this pathway for our generation, our next generation, and in respecting the people who've come before us is so vital for, I, I never even, I was selfish. I can do it all myself. What do I need advice from my dad for? I'm smart. I went to college. You know, where, where do you fit into speaking into my life? And I'm already, mm-hmm. I can read faster than you, dad. I can type faster than you. I'm, I've got more likes on social media. Isn't that what's most important? And the answer is no. And I love the phrase that says, it's not about the talents of few. It's about the sacrifices of many. And that's what things are built upon. We're doing what we're doing today because other people have sacrificed themselves so yep. that we can be here. And look at yep. Memorial Day that just passed the ultimate sacrifice. And if we don't honor and respect the people who have come before us, I have no idea how you're going to be able to have true righteous influence in this world. So how do you plan on, I mean, you obviously plan on educating um, Harper about her family. Like what are the things that you think are going to be important for her to, you know, what do you want to pass down? What do you want her to, what do you want to instill? And how do you go about doing that? Like, have you thought about that? Like, are there things that you want to be able to tell her or like, you know, things that are you're thinking now that you understand that you can't have these conversations because she's four years old. You know, have you thought about, all right, these are the things that I want to share. Like, this is my like, do you I mean, do you ask yourself, like, what is my definition of love? What is my definition of good and evil? How would I explain that to my yeah. daughter? You know what I mean? Like, how would I explain to her what kind of guy, what, 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 what kind of man to look for? Like, you know, these guiding yeah. principles, you know, for me. I, you know, and I'm not, I'm not selling our, our, our thing, but like, that's what I use the app for. That's what I use yeah. like Lena and life art for is because I know that I might change in five, 10 years if I'm even around, if I'm lucky enough to be around. But I know that there are certain things like already in my mind that I think are important, like as guiding principles, values, and just like an understanding of like how the world works and like, what's your, like, what are you capable of? <laughs> like I try to instill in my son even though he's young, that like his mind is the most important thing, right? That's the most important muscle that you have. After that, yeah. it's your heart. And like, how do you take care of your mind? You learn. How do you take care of your body? By eating right, by like, you know, staying in shape, by doing like exercises and stuff. So I'm concerned about it. I'm paranoid. For some reason, like I've already, I've already accepted the fact that I'm not going to be around. Like I've already accepted my own death. And I'm like, literally every day is a bonus for me. You know what huh. I mean? I'm literally walking around. It's, it sounds really weird. And I'm probably a little. No, crazy, that doesn't sound weird. That sounds yeah, right. Like, like I'm walking around as if I'm not even here anymore. You know what I mean? And I'm, and I'm trying to put as much as I can into this life arc because who knows whether I'll be here or not. And that's not like a use case and that's not like a motivating factor, but I just know that like, I want to get everything out that's in my heart and in my mind somewhere a it's good for me because i know that i can reflect and i actually like ask myself like what kind of person do i want to be and am i living these principles because that's another thing claude which i think you know is like you can say i want to speak truth or i want to be you know this person and this person but those are just words like you have to live it you have to be that way you know what i mean um and there's a lot of fake yeah i mean there's there's a lot of different people out there that don't necessarily embody or live the principles that they say they believe in or want to verbalize you know what i mean so these questions that you're attacking are some of the the questions i think that human beings have been attacking since the first day they started walking on this earth why am i here what is truth what is good and evil am i good am i evil why why is there suffering and pain in this world and what am i supposed to do about it and what is my purpose here on earth and and these are these are questions that our children need to know because a child that walks in truth is a child that's blessed a child a man a woman that walks in truth is is purpose driven and and there is a a flame of um of righteous influence placed upon their life and any person that you believe has influenced you positively towards a passionate righteous destination they they were gifted with truth so as a father I, I want to share these things with my child and, and I want them to not only know them all the time because I feel like I'm going to need to be a chief repeating officer to my child forever. Mm-hmm. But the, the point is, if I can put them somewhere, like you said, how beautiful would that be? And I, I believe that the, the what we're doing here on earth with my faith, I believe we're meant to glorify God. And that, that what that looks like for some people may be different. What it looks like for me is being a man of righteous influence. And that goes for my home, that goes for my friends, that goes for my community, and that Mm -hmm. goes for my my business. And and what is right and wrong? What's good and evil? I, I have dabbled in both, and I cannot define it. 
but I know that scripture can, I know that we've done it for many years and that it seems to make sense to me. And it, it, it says in my heart that, you know, what is the biggest commandment? Love thy neighbor as thyself and love your Lord with all your heart, soul and mind. And I'm like, wow, that, that sounds pretty nice. And it sounds simple, you know? Yeah. And it it sounds simple. Is. If you actually break it down, like it's actually much, you know, the rules that are laid down are like much more, it's much more simple than we think. The yeah. difficulty is living it. The yes, difficulty so, is loving your neighbor when he kills your cow or when he like yeah. <laughs> you know, throw, throws a brick through your window. Right? And once you learn how to apply, and I'm always, when I hear these things, the self-help talks, I'm like, that's great. Give me a handle where I can actually apply that to my life. And right. when you learn the, the different things of, oh, you know what? It's, it's probably nice for me to put my phone down when I'm in the elevator. Wow, I should probably stand up when a woman enters the room. Maybe when I when I write an email, I should never write an email with, with a spirit of hate in my in my voice. Um, when I speak to my father and my mother, I should speak in a in a perspective of knowing that they're authority and that I have to respect them for being my parents, regardless of how they treat me and what they say. You know, these are these are core things that some children nowadays, they may not ever get that lesson from their parents. And, and my they definition only get is to, it if they see it from you. Yeah. I believe that the loudest sermon I'm ever going to preach is the life that I live. When people see me and, and they see and, and I, I mean, I'm not perfect. Like I said, I am littered with problems and issues, but I do believe that I've gotten some things right. And I do believe that I'm walking in truth. And I do believe that I'm willing and able to continue living this life and, and I want other people to see that and to see that regardless of my circumstance, I'm still joyful. And I want people to ask me, what is it? You know, I, why are you? And I want to mm -hmm. tell them. And, and especially my kids. And my definition of success, by the way, and there's a Earl Nightingale. I don't know if you know who that is. I know. Is, yep. But he, when I started doing life coaching, my life coach came to me and said, I want you to listen to Earl Nightingale and yeah. talked about goal setting and the difference between a person that graduated from Princeton and there was a hundred of them and only actually 10 of them actually made it to what the world would call success is they learned how to set goals. And the, the success is not a destination. The success is the ability to define it in goals and then to, to accomplish goals that lead you towards success. So how do I know I'm successful? If I'm able to accomplish goals, if I yeah. set a goal and I cross it off because I'm attaining what I'm defining as success. And the, the problem is, if I say success is I want to make $100,000 this year or success is I want to launch a business, once you get there, then what? You're not satisfied. Exactly. You're, exactly. You're, you exactly. still have somewhere else you want to go. It's never enough. What are your goals? Are you attaining them? If you're attaining them, you're successful. If you're not attaining them, you need to go check yourself so, and you need to figure out what it is you need to do to attain them. So maybe success is your ability to do what you say. Is, is to be able to know how to set goals, to learn how to set goals, to, to yeah. make sure that they fall in line with your virtues and your core values. And then once you have your virtues and core values and you set your goals and you think that these are the right things to do, attain them, you know, achieve them, whatever it looks like. Quick question, because I, I, haven't, I haven't had this conversation with my son yet. And I probably assume that you've had it with your daughter um, because you do have like such a strong foundation of faith. But like, how would you explain the concept of like, have you explained the concept of like the Lord or God to Harper? And if so, the, how? The cutest thing that she says to me is that God is in heaven and he loves me. And God sent Jesus here to live in my heart. When mm. she says that, and that's, that goes from Sunday school and that goes from prayers that we have. That's what she thinks. She thinks Jesus lives inside of her and is is and loves her. And she thinks God loves her. And I just think that when you ask the first question we talked about is, is about love, is I just want her to know that God loves her. And that's it. And, and at this point in her life, that's all I really want to, because there will be times where even I am angry at God. I question his love for me. And I mm -hmm. think that we're meant to wrestle with these major issues. But if she has a foundation of knowing these things, teachings from her father and her stepmother and from other people in her life it mm -hmm. will never leave her it will never leave her check out i mean check out the story of jacob obviously him wrestling with god yeah um, i know you gotta go but um you have you heard of this um professor from the university of toronto um this guy named jordan peterson i'll send you some of his stuff um he's i mean i he's probably one of the most brilliant like modern um thinkers alive he used to be a harvard professor 
um, of psychology. He's a clinical psychologist, and then he's a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto. He became really well known because he basically recorded all of his classes on yeah. YouTube and just like let it all out for free. And he's, you know, he's a, he knows sociology, he knows neuroscience, he knows psychology, he knows clinical psychology, and he knows the Bible inside and out. And he did a series of lectures called The Psychological Significance of the Bible, where he literally went line for line, starting from Genesis, going through like the stories of Abraham, the stories of Jacob, the stories of Noah, the stories of Cain and Abel, and basically saying, much like what we talked about, like these stories are not here by accident. And you don't have to take the literal meaning, including the story of Christ, but like, what's the lesson learned? Like, what are these stories trying to tell us about yeah. the human existence, about God, about like the rules of the world? So you will definitely enjoy it. I'll send it to you. Do you have you ever heard of David Brooks? No. He's a, a Yale professor and he wrote this book called The Second Mountain. And it talks about the resume virtues versus the eulogy virtues. Everybody climbs the first mountain. And the sooner and earlier we fall off the first mountain onto our face and start climbing the second mountain, the better we'll be. And I, I think that my one plea as a handle to use is that I pray for every adolescent, every child, every man that's becoming, every boy that's becoming a man, that they realize that life is not about building your own resume and building your own um, success story. It's about loving other people. It's about becoming the person that you're meant to be in whatever standard you, you exist and being a part of a community to give back to a community um, through love. And it's, um, it's important that we realize that whether we're an NFL superstar or whether we're uh, um, serving at a restaurant, that it's all important as long as we realize what we're doing it for. Yeah. I, I really, good really love talking yeah, to you, man. And again, if you want to do this again, I'm more yeah, we'll happy do it again. to sit down and sure. talk to you. Yeah, I mean, I think we can, we can definitely do it again. So we'll talk soon. Our lives are not linear. What we remember is not defined by time, but by experience. We remember the emotions and people surrounding specific moments and live time as one continuous day that is the experience of our lives. One of the most important, meaningful, and challenging experiences we face is being and becoming parents. These are conversations about moments in our lives, what they have taught us, and the questions we all face about how to live in the world.